Question. What is the biggest obstacle while cultivating bodhicitta? Answer. The biggest obstacle is the ego. The ego is very cunning. It can use all the knowledge we have acquired, even the Dharma, to disturb our minds. Its reasons are often plausible, making it difficult to decline it. Therefore, we should clearly understand what we really want to achieve. This is very important. For practitioners, our aspiration determines our ultimate spiritual attainments. However, in specific circumstances, it's often hard to identify which mind is functioning. For example, when we serve in a Dharma center and propagate the Dharma for the benefit of sentient beings, it may seem like we are doing Buddhisattva work. Perhaps we also believe that we are widely turning the Dharma wheel and benefiting uh, sentient beings, thinking that what we do is similar to the activities of Buddhas and Buddhisattvas. However, what is the true foundation of our thoughts and actions? If we analyse it carefully, it may be attachment or ego. Consequently, the bigger our mission the stronger our attachment. This phenomenon is prevalent. As a result, what we eventually achieve must be the ego and the samsaric mind. Actually, this can be discerned. Some individuals build a grand temple but don't have any disciples. Why? Because people can discern. Such individuals practiced generosity and accumulated merits in their past lives, so they are wealthy in this life. Others are willing to donate money to them, or the government allocates funds to them, so they build a grand temple. However, because they lack bodhicitta, sentient beings don't want to approach them. Practitioners have the ability to discern. They may initially think that you have generated bodhicitta and consider you great. However, after spending some time with you, such as a few months, half a year, or at most one year, they will know your true nature. It is not something that can be fabricated or hidden. Then they will leave you. Some people want to build a temple and propagate the Dharma to benefit sentient beings. What they talk about are all noble things. However, over time, others can sense whether they have generated bodhicitta. What does bodhicitta look like? Merely talking about it is useless. It requires actual practice. While practicing it, over time, others will naturally discern it. Therefore, Some people may seem to have accomplished great missions, but may not necessarily have bodhicitta. In the age of Dharma decline, some beginners may be easily deceived. They may not understand the principles behind taking refuge in the three jewels, setting up spirit tablets, reciting the Buddha's name and performing liberation rituals. If you are renowned or have a grand temple, they may approach you for help. But what do we look like? Are we cultivating the ego? When your mission grows, do your ego and arrogance also grow? That's how the samsaric mind works. As your mission grows, your ego and arrogance also grow instead of diminishing. Moreover, your temper gets worse and you don't have much compassion for sentient beings. Your compassion is superficial rather than genuine. When seeing sentient beings, you don't have loving kindness. When seeing practitioners, you don't have joy. You are concerned with the differences and conflicts between yourself and others. 
When you see someone progressing well in their practice, you become jealous. Such people have strong jealousy because strong ego and arrogance lead to strong jealousy. If they see someone progressing well in their practice, they will slander others and form factions. This is the typical samsaric mind. When you have just become a monastic, you may try to recruit disciples everywhere, always wishing to expand your dharma activities. When you see someone becoming a great master, you may also wish to achieve the same result. Such thoughts are meaningless. As practitioners, we should not think and act in this way. Instead, we should diligently engage in spiritual practice and help sentient beings according to the circumstances. Back then, besides Guru Uranian, many other teachers could also bestow the empowerment of the mind and mind practice. He was not the only one who could bestow this empowerment. However, his virtues and spiritual attainments were convincing, so later disciples recognised him as the third patriarch of the mind in mind practice. If another person also achieved high spiritual attainments like him, there would be two patriarchs. It would be akin to the case that after the sixth patriarch, Two generations of great Chan masters emerged and five major schools of Chan came into being. They have received the Dharma and realised it. Otherwise, if there were only one or two disciples in each generation, the lineage would gradually diminish over time. At some point, the lineage might cease. If the teachings were transmitted to only one disciple, the lineage would be easily lost, right? Transmitting the Dharma to multiple disciples is like giving birth to children. If you have ten children, it is not easy for the family line to cease. If you have only one child, it is easy for the family line to cease. The same goes for the Dharma. If the Dharma lineage is transmitted to only one disciple, it is easy for the lineage to cease. However, if you haven't realised the Dharma, you are not qualified to transmit it. If you transmit the Dharma without realising it, wouldn't you transmit it incorrectly? That is not right. If you haven't realised the true nature of reality, you cannot transmit the Dharma or become a guru. Otherwise, you will encounter problems. Both Tibetan Buddhism and the Chan school in Chinese Buddhism emphasize Dharma lineage. Lineage also emphasizes realization. If you haven't realized the teaching, why would the teacher transmit it to you? If you haven't attained enlightenment, the teacher won't transmit the Dharma to you. Even if they do transmit it to you, it will be useless. They would rather not transmit the teachings. At some point, the Yan Men School and Fayan School in China were almost lost. Why? Because there are no successors. They would rather let the lineage cease than transmit it to unqualified disciples. Question. In Tibetan Buddhism, it is taught that those who generate bodhicitta should not abandon any sentient being. However, it also emphasizes that we should stay away from those who have broken the precepts. How should we resolve this contradiction? Answer. In the journey of Dharma practice, we should stay close to good spiritual friends and stay away from negative influences. Those attached to food should avoid people with the same attachment. If you are attached to food, why do you still hang out with other foodies? 
if you are not attached to any food, don't need to eat or don't salivate when others are eating, then this principle doesn't apply to you. In that case, you don't need to be afraid to be with them. Instead, you can enlighten them while staying with them. In terms of staying away from those who have broken the precepts, it means that if we cannot properly uphold the precepts, we need to be cautious of those who might influence us to break the precepts. If you cannot properly uphold the precepts but still hang out with them, wouldn't you quickly break the precepts? If you can perfectly uphold a precept, you will be fine. At that time, you can hang out with them without being swayed. You can even hug one on the left and one on the right. When you are no longer attached to inherent existence, what are you still afraid of? At that point, there is no such problem. Therefore, the same principle applies to precepts. If you can perfectly uphold a precept, it ceases to exist and you no longer need to be afraid. Beginners are often easily influenced by the environment. So, having a higher requirement for the environment can benefit both their spiritual progress and personality cultivation. Novice practitioners should strive to stay in a tranquil environment. However, after making progress in our practice, we should benefit all sentient beings without distinguishing between positive and negative beings. When Buddhazava Siddhigarbha vows to go to hell, he certainly doesn't aim to go there to stay with good spiritual teachers. From the perspective of the Buddhazatva path, after generating Buddhacitta, on the one hand, we should stay with good spiritual teachers. On the other hand, we should benefit all sentient beings with compassion. If we aspire to attain the perfect and supreme Buddhahood, we should never abandon any sentient beings. When we talk about not abandoning any sentient beings, the key is our mind. As long as we have impartial compassion towards every sentient being, our compassion will be perfect. What does it mean to have compassion? It means to have compassion in one's heart. When we talk about liberating all sentient beings, please don't forget that we are also sentient beings. So, first, we must liberate ourselves. The key is not whether we liberate ourselves or others, but whether our aspiration is for the benefit of all sentient beings in the Dharma realm. Who is the object of your aspiration? This is fundamental. When we practice... The point is not whether our actions are for the benefit of ourselves or others. If your intention is to benefit all sentient beings, then even the actions of benefiting yourself are okay. If you benefit others in order to better benefit yourself, then your intention is still selfish. On the surface, it may seem like you are benefiting others. But in reality, your motive is to better benefit yourself. Therefore, it is essential to understand this. Benefiting others doesn't necessarily mean having Buddhacitta, and benefiting oneself doesn't necessarily mean lacking Buddhacitta. Those who have just generated Buddhacitta should first spend more time practicing meditation and cultivating the mind. Although it may seem like benefiting oneself, it is actually to benefit others more effectively. To benefit all sentient beings in the Dharma realm, you practice discipline, concentration and wisdom. 
what you do is to benefit sentient beings more effectively. This is similar to the case of going to university for the sake of serving the people. You cannot give up your university education, otherwise you may not be competent. If you go to university for the sake of serving the people, your intention is correct.